morning as we go to the Chitas of today. We are holding in the portion of Emmer. We're holding in the uh, chapter 22, verse number 17. God spoke to Moshe saying, I don't know about to speak to Aaron and his sons. The Coven is known to the entire Jewish people. The might tell him, he shall tell them, Ish, Ish, any man. He base, uh, he base the Yisrael from the house of the Jew, from the house of Israel. And I go to, and I give it Yisrael for any, con uh, any convert that lives in Israel. I shall keep a carbon, or bring a sacrifice to hold the Drechem to all your vows, to hold the Drechem to all your, your charitable givings. I can share Kivu Lashem Oila. Which will bring to the Abishta an oila. Now she says, what's the difference in Nidrechem or Nidvaisechem, Nidvaisam? Nidrechem, when it's, is, is when a person says, it's a comment on Hami. It means he makes a personal commitment to bring a burnt offering. It's, a, it's upon me a burnt offering. And Nidvaisechem, the nation, is when he says, when he says, it doesn't say it's a comment on me. He says, this is the, the donation. So the guy says, I'm giving, I'm giving, a, I'm giving, a, I'm giving a cow to the, to the temple. Or he says, this cow to the temple. That's the difference between a nether and a dava. Dava is a lie. And the dechem, the darim is a lie. It's a me. And the dava is that this is going to be. The same chem. It's for favor for you. It shall be an unblemished male. Whether it's from the cattle, from the sheep, or from the goats. Now she says, God is saying here, yeah, bring me something that is worthy to appease for you before me. That will make you favorable for me. The will of the saints are meaning appeasement in French. But, I, but with a burnt offering of birds, no blemished, no unblemished or male birds are required. It's not rendered invalid. It is a defect unless a limb is missing. So we're talking about an animal. An animal needs to be a unblemished, something that doesn't have any kind of blemish. Verse number 20, call Hashem by more anything that has a blemish. It's a cleaver you can bring as a carbon. You lay lots in the chem because then it won't be favorable for you. Verse 21, Vishka Yaakim Zevashlam, if anybody brings off a peace offering, Hashem to God, the Fali Neder to declare a vow, either the dove or again to give a uh, gift, a baka, whether it's in the cattle, but say no, it's in the flock. Come in you. It needs to be unblemished, complete. But I'm not saying that it should be. Uh, for your goodwill. It should not have any defect. Now she says, for verbally designation, a particular animal, if he designates it merely in his mind, it doesn't obligate in a vow. A vow means where a person says it verbally, says it open. Verse number 22. Averis. A shover, an animal that's blindness, or it's broken bone, a chorot, or it's a split eyelids or lips, a avelis, a garov, one who has warts, a alephis, who has dry lesions, a lesakrivu, or weeping lesions, a lesakrivu, as Eila Lashem, he can't bring any of these animals to God. He should not place it as a fire offering on the altar for God. Now she says, this is a noun, a feminine equivalent to a yivore. An animal should not have a defect of blindness. A shaver is a broken leg. Chorutz, chorutz is a, uh, a cut. And his eyelids are split, notched. Or similar, its lips are split. Yavelis is a wart. Gadev is a, uh, it's a uh, similar to Sanzigilefis. It's a, it's a concept of a lish. It says three times, the prohibition three times is mentioned here in the in verse 20 to 25. 
and it comes to the it comes to warn a that you're not allowed to uh, you're not allowed to sanctify an animal that is blemished. You're not allowed to slaughter an animal that's blemished, and you're not allowed to pour its blood on the on the altar an animal that is blemished. Verse twenty three was shared with says Sharuva Kalot, and for an ox or sheep that has mismatching limbs, the dove attaches it or never lay lots. Or on cloven hooves, it may be making it, it can be brought as a donation, but it cannot, but as a vow, it's not accepted. As she says, one limb is, is bigger than the other. A kaluat means that it uh, that its hooves are on, on, on cloven. So it has a it has a something that the, the kosher animal has to have cloven hooves, and this this goat or this sheep doesn't have cloven hooves. The dove tasset. You allowed to give it as a donation to the temple so the temple could sell it, for example, to sell his money. Well, Neda, but to give it on the Mizbeach, he cannot give it on the Mizbeach. Hello, Yudatza. But I, what Kansi comes granted acceptance, Yudatza is, I must say, that a consecration for the altar. That's not talking about he gave it as a donation that the, that the, that the, that the, that the uh, Mitosh can sell the animal and use it. Uh, use the money. We're talking about the concept of uh, of use of, of, of the mizbeach of bringing it as a sacrifice. Verse twenty-four. Any animals with testicles are squashed, crushed, pulled out, severed. Leisakivu now was being an offering to God. Neutering, let it with neuter. They they. Do to your animal, you're not allowed to do that, Rashi Taylor says. Rashi says, in terms of damage, the testicles, the membrane, mark, baits of mark, and beyond, the testicles squashed by hand. Pastor's Christian mark is more severe than a crushing. Natuk is torn off by hand until the threads upon which they are suspended straps, but they are still contained within the scrotum. The scrotum is not even torn off. Because of Kutzim Bechli, this is a cardus, is one that you do as an instrument. Umar is a t- uh, squashed. Uncle is rendered as, as dimiris, which is equivalent to the and a special crushing. The cossus crushed. The uncle is rendered as word with this. This thing. that's a concept of crushing. This thing that castrate any livestock or wild animal, even of an unclean species, you're not allowed to castrate your animal. This is why the verse says, in your land, to include the species found in your land. For it's impossible to say that castration is prohibited only in that itself. Because prohibition of castration is an obligation associated with the body of the person of the animal. And every commandment associated with the body of a person applies both to the land of Israel and outside the land. So you're not allowed to castrate your animals, whether it's in America or in Israel. Verse 25, for the hand of the Gentiles, not, you shall not offer up a food for your God of these blemished animals. Because their injuries upon them, they will not be accepted. As she says, literally, if in the hands of a foreigner, meaning if a non Jew brought a sacrifice, and hand it over to the client to offer it up to heaven. He shall not offer up on behalf of any blemished animals. And even though blemished animals not deemed invalid as sacrificed by the children of Noah, by all non-Jews, unless they are limb missing, that rule applies only to private altars in the field. However, on the altar in the Mishkan, you shall only offer them up only that that has not blemished. So if a guy brings an offering, a guy can bring an offering to the base of Mikdash if he wants to. But he has to bring an um, unblemished, like a Jew. You shall ever accept an unblemished animal from them. That's why the scriptures early says the passion, Ish, Ish, any man whatsoever, where the double expression comes to include non-Jews who make a vow and donation like a Jew, it needs to be an unblemished. Shasam, their injuries. To atone you. Verse number 26, when an ox or sheep or goat is born, while your shivish shamatah has seen my remain six days, seven days under with its mother, 
and for the seventh day, Vahala and offered that it's allowed to bring a sacrifice. So the first seven days, you can't bring a sacrifice from an animal that was born in the first seven days. He evaluated what means that it was born. This comes to exclude if the, if the animal needed a cesarean section. He had to take the animal through a cesarean section that doesn't have this law. And so too, an ox or sheep, you should not slaughter its offering on the same day. This prohibition applies with a female, meaning the mother animal, naming that it's prohibited to slaughter a mother animal and a male or female offspring the same day. The prohibition does not apply, however, to a male, the father of the animal, and it's permissible to slaughter a father animal along with a male or female offspring on the same day. I say vas benay, ab benay vaisay. This includes this in prohibition of slaughtering offspring then its parents. Doesn't make any difference what comes first, the mother or the child, or the child or the mother. Verse 29, v'chizis was ever taid l'ashem, when you bring an altar offering to God, the same time tizbachu, it should be given your own free will. Now she says, the taid dilaz of hasim izaru, from the very beginning of your slaughtering, Take care that it should be done acceptable to you and make it acceptable. When you bring an offering to God, make it acceptable. Make it that it should be for free will. Although it has already been stated that Thanksgiving offerings by eating the day sacrifice, they repeat it here exclusively to warn us that the slaughtering must be performed on this condition. Again, the Kmashava. Do not slaughter with the intention of eating it on the next day. But if you have that invalid intention in mind, sacrifice is not accepted for you. And it's called pigle, as we learned before. It's indeed will be rejected. Another explanation, let's say, them, knowingly, from here we learned that if someone slaughtered an animal in an incidental manner, meaning according to Rashi, without intending to slaughter, just to pick up the knife or throw it, or to taste this is not intended to slaughter, but only to serve, sever the organs. Or he thought it was an ordinary animal, did not realize that it was slaughtered to the Holy Sacrifice. And even though the animal is fit to eat as an ordinary, non consecrated meat, nevertheless, regarding this being slaughtered as a Holy Sacrifice, it's deemed unfit. You need to have, when you bring a sacrifice, you need to have that it's brought, let it sign the chem. That is brought for the sake of the sacrifice. And even though the animal is, is, is eaten in order, that's it, it has to be brought for the sacrifice. It could not, it's unfit. Although the scripture has already stated that a sacrifice is not acceptable if it's slaughtered, slaughtering one intended to eat it after the permissible time. In the case of sacrifice, they may eat them for two days. If they satisfies it again, according to no sacrifice, that it must be eaten. The same day, name that the, this too must be slaughtered with the intention of eating it within the permissible time. That's what the Pasuk teaches us. It not only that you have to eat it in the right time, it needs to be shechted that you're eating it in the right time. The only one who knows that is God, really. That's why you have to be honest and say that you had the wrong thought. You have to eat it on that day. And now I'll leave it over till the next morning. And now she says again the same thing as explained above. Taylor dates thereby here to warn that the slaughtering must be formed with disintention. But it meant his fixed time limit for eating that has already been stated. And the flesh of his thanksgiving of shall be eaten on the day it's off. And I am God, I know. Know who decreed this matter and don't perceive it as unimportant. I know what you're thinking, so to say. Verse 31 of Shabbat Mitzvah Yisai, you shall keep my commandments, I see some you shall do them. Ani Hashem, I am God. Ashes Shemaitem Zuha Mishnah, this is learning. You need to learn to be able to know what means to keep. I see some, and you'll do. Zuha Maisa, this is the concept of action. Verse 32, and don't desecrate my holy name. And I will be sanctified amidst the children of Israel. 
אני השם מקדשכם, I am the Lord who sanctified you. Rashi says, let's chalu, I transgress my commandments intentionally. Now, if it's not already implied by the verse, you shall not desecrate my holy name, and it's not to transgress God's name, will be, uh, I will be sanctified. So what did we learn from this verse? Adding, I shall sanctify in the midst of a bunch of children of Israel. It teaches us, surrender your life and do not transgress God's commandment and thus sanctify his name. Now one might think that the commandment applies even in private, meaning if not in the presence of 10 or more Jews. Therefore, the Torah tells us, says here, I shall be sanctified amidst the children of Israel. One is obligated to sacrifice one's life to avoid transgressing God's commandment only in the presence of 10 or more Jews. That's when you sanctify God's name, you do it in the presence of a minion. And one sacrifice oneself, one shall do it with the willingness to die. Anyone who submits to sacrifice of well and assuming that God will surely perform a miracle for him and save his life. If he's going on self-sacrifice to show God's miracles, this, this uh, God will perform a miracle. For this person, God does not perform miracles. So we find in the case of uh, that the evil Nebuchadnezzar threatened to throw them into a burning fire. They did not submit themselves on the condition that God would perform a miracle. And the scripture says, the the God we worship, he can save us from this burning fierce furnace from in the hands of the king. If not, let it be known, O oh, that God, O oh, king, that you will not worship your God, neither will we prostrate us of the golden image that you have set up. We see from here that they said whatever the outcome will be, whether God will rescue them or God will not rescue them. Let it be known that God is our God. So, so, that, so therefore, that's, you don't go on Kiddush Hashem, that God is going to save you. You go on Kiddush Hashem, and whatever happens, happens. That's a true concept of sanctifying God's name. Verse 33, I am God who took you out of Egypt. To be for you as a God, I am God. I took you out in this condition. I took you out in the condition that you'll be willing to sacrifice yourself and sanctify God's name. And do not think that, think that this is not an obligation you will not receive reward for the self-sacrifice. Let's say Chas Shalom. A person gives, goes on self-sacrifice and he is killed. Therefore, the English says, Ani Hashem salam Don't worry, I will reward you for your Kiddush Hashem, for your self That completes the Chumash for today. We now go to the time of the day we are holding in the middle of 46th chapter of time. Oops, I'm sorry. But that was yesterday, so we continue in the 46th chapter of time. That's all my shame. I mean, this is what we say. And we make a bracha. We say, which sanctified us with his mitzvahs. Blessed to be he who has betrothed us, like he got married. Kedushin sanctified us with his mitzvah. The Hebrew word Kedushanu generally renders one who sanctified us. It is rendered it who betrothed us. Because the Hebrew word Kedushin betrothal for a mitzvah too are Ka'adam Amakadish Isha. So that's the bracha. You say a bracha, you say, with this, I'm getting married to you. What means a marriage? With this, I'm betrothed to you. What means a betrothal? With this, I have a relationship with you. With this, not only I have a relationship with you, with this, I have a personal relationship with you. So every person says the bracha, that he says, in essence, I have a personal relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. God, I'm a Kaddish Isha, like a man who betrothes his wife. Because he wants to be exclusive with her or with him. What's your cause of? As it says, you get married, you betroth one, you betroth to each other, and with that, you get married, and you become one flesh. 
So if that happens in marriage, in this relationship, so it surely happens between us and God. You should realize with the mitzvah, with the learning of the Torah, is, is, is infinitely suppressed. It. The union with the divine soul that is engaged in Torah and the commandments and the ver, verifying soul. My nefesh achyun is below shame, and the verifying soul, my nefesh abaham is my animalistic soul. And the garments referred to above, and it's got a little but oid ain't safe by the whole. They are all been united with God. Like a marriage, like a yichud, like a man, so to say, like one flesh. This spiritual union infinitely surpasses the physical union of man and wife. In relation to a physical union is valid only in the sense that in this world, there can be no greater union than that of a man and a wife. This union is turned kedushin. So that's why we give an example. The greatest union in this world is marriage. Greatest relationship is marriage. So that's the analogy. But the, the but the Abishta's union with us is much greater than marriage. King Solomon. All of us shall have blessed memory. song of songs. Which is, sounds like a love song between a man and a woman is really the concept of the love song between Jews and the God as well. This union is being like an attachment, an external level of unity with longing, a more inward level of unity with desire. And even an more inward unity, an embrace and kiss. And that's what Shleim HaMelech wanted to say. He wanted to teach us how to have a union with our Baruch Hu. Because we can understand this union. So all the above matters of union are found in a Jew's relationship with God. Two Torah mitzvahs. The concept of attachment. Content of of chafetza desire tzama lachan nafshi. The book we explained before. Content of doing the mitzvah, the shikah, saying the dvar Hashem, etc. etc. We explained before the three levushim, the garments of thought, understanding godliness, the garments of speech, speaking words of Torah, and the garments of action. So until now, the Alter Rebbe expanded on the theme. Of unity, the standing kiddushanu as deriving from the kiddushin we troll. Al Rebbeinah goes on to say that the word kiddushanu also alludes to a sanctification a Jew achieves through Torah mitzvah. Sanctification implying a state of exhalation and separation from all worlds. Kedusha, the concept of kedusha itself, the meaning of the word kedusha. You sanctified us. This is also the meaning of the word Kiddishanu, sanctified us. The word Kiddishanu, who sanctified here, meaning you elevated us. This mitzvah not only betrothed us, this mitzvah elevated us to the heights of supreme holiness. Which is the Kedusha of the Ebishter. You elevated us to holiness. Without this mitzvah, we wouldn't be elevated. Now with this mitzvah, we have uplifted ourselves. We have put ourselves on a whole different world. The Kedusha lost Navdala. We know that the word Kedusha means holiness is indicated separate, a separateness. You need a separation. We say that we find it Saturday night. To be able to separate between what's holy and unholy. So we have elevated ourselves. We have separated ourselves through this mitzvah. We have separated ourselves from the world. 
and we have elevated ourselves to a holy plateau. He became a save of Kalam. We went from the world and we have elevated ourselves to the, to the quality of the encompassing world. Ashain Yachl established them. Gee, which is being unable to close itself within them. We, up, we uplift ourselves to a world that is above. Mamalach, the way God comes in the world, we connect ourselves the way God is, so to say, above the world, in the world. Because of the inable created beings to absorb the extreme holiness of this transcending level, God's as words like, cannot close itself within the world and therefore affect them in an encompassing manner. It is this lofty level that a Jew elevates through their performance of mitzvahs. So the Amish gave us vessels in the world that he gave us the capability to transcend the world. And that's the power of a mitzvah, because the mitzvah is the, is the mitzvah of God in the physical world. So I put on tefillin today. It's tefillin is a physical entity. It's a, it's a box made out of made out of leather. It has it has portions made out of parchments. And ultimately, I think this is God's will. So this has this is a, a worldly thing, but at the same moment, it's something that's above the world. It's something that has the will of God within it. So I have the capability to this switch to connect to a super world, to connect to a world that is above this world as it's in the world. Because it's not anymore a parchment. It's not anymore a box. It's thrilling. And so to every mitzvah. So that's the word. Asher shanu. The Ebushta uplifted us. God gave us the capability to have Kedusha. To connect to, our, to a, a reality that's above and beyond the physical reality. For through the union of the soul and its absorption into the light, of, in, into God's will, and that's what I do. I absorb myself into God's will. I do what God wants, so I become part of his will. And even my lips are dangerous. So then he becomes holy. Then he retains the quality, the degree of holiness of God himself, because that's God's will. So if, for example, I connect my thought to God's wisdom, so my thought has elevated itself. My thought has become now a wisdom that's greater than, self, than myself, than my own wisdom, that my wisdom would ever be able to accomplish. Because especially learning, for sure. When my wisdom becomes part of God's wisdom, I understand the Torah. Then you have an integration of a yichud, a chadim mamish. It becomes truly one. It becomes my wisdom comes to become part of the wisdom of God. It means I become the wisdom of God. And that's why it says in last week's portion, is a question? You shall be holy. Because I am holy. Self-understood, if you're going to connect to me, I am holy. <laughs> I am above the world. I am within the world. At the same time as I'm within the world, I am above the world. So too, you become within the world, above this world. So the, word, the verse gives us the reason why for a Jew to sanctify Containing within a God's supreme holiness, which you can attain through Tayyid and Mitzvah. The Amish says, We may not come holy. Come holy through me. You cannot become holy. You're a human being. What does it mean, connection to you? You shall be holy. How do I become holy? I'm a, I'm a physical entity. I'm a, I'm a human being. So the Amish says, Keep God the Shani. Come holy not through yourself. I'm holy through me. Through you learning Tayyid. Through I learning Tayyid. Through I doing a Mitzvah. I have elevated myself. I've become holy. I've become, because I've absorbed myself. I've taken my wisdom and absorbed it into God's wisdom. I've taken my guf and I've done the mitzvah. I've given over my body to God's ratzen. And now it became part of the will of our Kaddish Baruch. 
And that's why it says, and that's how you separate from the nation, to be me, to become me. And I have separated from nations. That here we see that a home implies separation, as mentioned earlier. That's what we say on Friday night, Saturday night. Because ultimately, if we go into the concept of the holiness of God, then we separate ourselves from any aspect in this world. As it says in the verse, Do all my commandments, and you'll be holy. The term your God is in possessive form. I become yours. You become mine. He calls the relationship set up a man betrothed a woman, thereby becoming his wife. We become bonded. When a man betrothes his wife, she becomes his and he becomes hers. The Avish says, Do my means, I become yours. I'm God, you're God. Amazing expression in the title. I'm God, you're God. I become yours. You become mine, I become yours. This is the meaning through the fulfillment of the commandments of mitzvahs. I become your God. In the same manner as we say in our davening, like Avram, like Yitzchak. The God of Isaac, the God of Abraham, each one, so to say, you imagine it, you say it every day in Davide, three times a day. So it sounds like they had the separate gods. Pass for Shalom. Because each one of them became a, it was a personal relationship. Same one God. We have one God, we have one Taylor. But each and every one of us has this personal relationship. Why do we give example of the office? Because they were talking about cover. They were chariot of God. The patriarch was totally dedicated to God and nullified. They became one with God. Vehicle, which is totally nullified to a tribe. They were truly married. They understood the word. Yes, there. Hey, With Talim and the Chlalom they were nullified and absorbed in his light. And so too it can be by every single one of us. Every single one of us, and it happens to us every single time we do a mitzvah. Every time we do a mitzvah, we accomplish this concept. When we learn Taylor, when we do mitzvahs, we come, and that's the bracha. You sanctified us. You became married to me. You, you have you betrothed to me with this mitzvah. Some Jews actually say the Ashkenazim say I said they were fully put on the talis. That we're getting betrothed. The Jew occupies himself with Torah. Study the performance of commandments, he's totally nullified and absorbed in God's light. Because why am I doing the mitzvah? God commanded me. I have a relationship with God and I want to fulfill God's desires. That's like in any relationship. When I'm betrothed, I have a relationship. So we fulfill each other's desires. And we're there for each other. The only difference in the patriarchs and other Jews is. But the patriarch was a state of constantly. <laughs> they were I'm in cover 24-7. I, I am not like that. I'm when I do the mitzvah. When I dive in, when I learn, then I'm completely committed to that situation. And if our sage of lesson made it made an obligation. The Gemara says, you, have to, you should stand up for anybody that does a mitzvah. Anybody does a mitzvah. You should not only stand up for a Talmud Chacham, a great sage. Anybody that does a mitzvah, you should stand up for him. 
A means for everybody to stand up. You should honor everybody. Why? Because everybody does mitzvahs. And at that time, he does a mitzvah. He's been elevated. He's been uplifted. After we put on hearts, even if he's a he's an uncultured and an illiterate, he did a mitzvah. And if he did a mitzvah, he's been sanctified. He's been elevated. When such a person performs a mitzvah, such as being recorded in the first verse of the Mesa Mitzvah, what must rise before him? And that's where they used to dig him out. It brings out the story. They used to stand up. That when they, when they brought the Bikurim to the Mesa Mikdash, it was a whole celebration when those Jews were coming from the, from the Alley of the Shalayim, and they would bring the Bikurim, the whole place would come up and stand up for them, even though they were simple Jews, because they were doing a mitzvah. And when you do a mitzvah, you're elevated. You're on a whole different level. Because your, your bottle at that moment, when they were bringing the Bikurim, they were totally bottled to the air, and they to ask them, God asked them to bring the recording, and they're doing it. What an amazing thing that a human being can elevate it themselves and go above themselves and do something that is above their understanding and their comprehension, but to do it because God wants them to do it. Because the second a Jew does something, because God wants them to do it, and uh, you don't have to be a great sage. But to understand that concept, because we all understand it, we make the bracha equally. We all make the same bracha. They sanctified us and commanded us with this mitzvah, etc., etc. Put on filling, uh, uh, lighting Shabbos candles, whatever the mitzvah be, whatever the mitzvah would be. And that moment when I make the bracha, and I do the mitzvah, at that moment, I need to respect not the person, but Hashem, Hashem, I respect God. I should respect the Ebishter, who has come part of that person at that moment. That's a wonderful, unbelievable thing, if you think about it. There's only one problem. Actually, maybe actually we don't feel this, this thing. But imagine if we felt every time we did a mitzvah, how we are uplifted to a higher level. We have separated ourselves. We have commun come united with the infinite light of God. I mean, that would truly be an amazing, amazing situation. That if every one of us felt this union, we don't. Why don't we? Not because it's not happening. We don't feel it because of the barrier of our bodily grossness with which the soul dwells. That the, the body has not yet been refined. And the problem with the body has not been refined, it dims the eyes of the soul. From seeing the divine vision. Like they were not like the patriarchs, the great prophets, the great tzaddikim, who saw who saw their world. Expression tzaddikim, the expression of Talmud that tzaddikim see their world in their life. Most of us need to have, we need to wait for Mashiach or, 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 or if, uh, if the 120 years. That we can have Ria Selakus, that we can have this Ria, this concept of seeing. A tzaddik, a great person, a tzaddik, has the capability of seeing it right now. These great tzaddikim are able to, to able in this world to see divine vision normally, seeing it only in the world to come. And that's the problem. That is the struggle. Not that it that it changes the reality. That's it. The truth is, if you don't. In essence, the Alta Rebbe is saying, you, you, if you don't believe in this, then you make a brachla batala. Then you're saying God's name in vain. So today, we say the brachla, the tzaddik and the regular person says the bracha. Why do we say the bracha? Because that's the truth. That is what's happening the second we do a mitzvah. Whether we see it, the tzaddik says the bracha and he sees it. I say the bracha and I don't see it. Because why do I say the bracha? 
even though I don't see it, because I say the bracha, because that's the truth. That's what's happening. At Shekilishanu, at that moment that I did the mitzvah, I'm doing it. I connect, I become united with God. And at that moment, when I do the mitzvah, I've been elevated to a highest, my soul has now been connected to, inf to Ein Seif, to, an inf to infinity, to the essence of God, which now been elevated. And Abdul, that's why the Abish has is separated. I've elevated myself in this world. And truly each, every Jew would be capable of witnessing such a vision of holiness during the performance of mitzvahs were it not for the coarseness of the body. And that's one of the reasons why we back for the coming of Mashiach. That we'll be able to see Gil Elikos. We'll be able to see the revelation of God. That we'll be able to, when we say the bracha, it means Hashem, Mashiach comes and we'll say the bracha. I understand why all souls in heaven are waiting to come down because they can't see the bracha. They cannot do it anymore. They can't do a mitzvah. So even if they're Ganadin, they can't do mitzvahs anymore. So that's why they, even the, even the souls of Ganadin, are waiting to come down to the world again. So they'll be able to do the mitzvah and they'll be able to see at the time they're doing the mitzvah. They see the way godliness is permeating all the worlds and how he himself is elevating himself and becoming one with this godly, godly concept, which is truly an amazing concept if you can um, comprehend this aspect. That completes the Tanya of today. Today is the 11th day of the month, which is chapter 60 to chapter 65. You do those five chapters, you accomplish the chitas of the day. And I, uh, I uh, wish you a wonderful day and invite you to mention tomorrow. We'll continue the chitas of the day. I also invite you tonight. We're having 7.30, a new JLI class, Jew per natural. Is a new wonderful class of the JLI that goes through the concepts of dreams and all these things and dreams, dreams and directions, stars and signs, jinx and evil eyes, para and, and normal. So uh, these are four classes in the next four weeks um, uh, to come and learn together at Chabad at 7:30 tonight or on Zoom, you can come also and learn on Zoom. Much better to come and learn in Ashgabad. Um, and if you need a book, please call the office at 487-2934. I wish you a beautiful, wonderful, and happy, healthy day.